Welcome. Derek? <laughs> How are you doing, George? Carla? It's great to be here. Oh, it's great. My pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, that's a, it's excellent to have you. So, Carla, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, do you consider yourself an activist? Um, I am a Free State Project member, and I moved um, as part of the Free State Project to New Hampshire. Yes, I am a liberty activist, and um, and I believe very strongly that we should be breaking unjust laws. Excellent. And uh, what unjust law or illegitimate authority have you disobeyed? <laughs> Where to start? I mean, you know, there are the basic stuff like most of us uh, speed from time to known to uh, commute very fast down to Manchester. <laughs> and um, I mean, I, my primary things have been um, 420 celebrations. You know, I believe that we as individuals have the, you know, supreme decision to decide what we want to put into our bodies and that. Um, you know, no one else can decide that for us. So I uh, tend to go to the 420 rallies. I do smoke out there. So and, uh, tell our guests who might not be familiar, what is 420? 420 in New well, 420 is sort of an urban myth of that's the time that kids used to go stop behind the school, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's basically, you know, it's people um, who, who believe that marijuana should be legal and that we should be able to smoke it when we want and how we want. And um, so the 420 rallies in New Hampshire are things where we get together in various um, areas. There's an ongoing one in Keene, which usually shows, uh, shuts down during the winter. And we have a giant rally coming up, um, or celebration as we like to call it, which will be on April 20th. So it'll be 420, 420. And I believe that's going to be at the State House. Excellent. So marijuana yeah. is still illegal. I can't believe it. I know. Can you imagine that a plant would be illegal? Hmm. So do you, do you know anything about the history of the plant? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, sure. I mean, really, you know, if you go back and you look at, um, you know, all, all the background, big surprise, it's, it's an issue of corporatism. And, you know, hemp was legal back in the 30s, and then um, the cotton industry was like, oh, we need to get rid of hemp. And then somewhere along the line, you know, the poor marijuana plant sort of got caught up in that and the reefer madness of it all, so to, so to say. And, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's so funny to me that people will accept that, you know, there's this plant that people want to use. It's a victimless crime, you know, and, and I feel very strongly on all this stuff. If there is no victim, there is no crime. And the state cannot be a victim because they're the, um, you know, they're the force. They're the coercive party. Um, so well, does the state, uh, I mean, even exist? You know, I mean, that's kind of like a, a fictional entity in a sense. What do you think about that? Well, you know, it's it's it would be nice if the state was our imaginary friend. Unfortunately, <laughs> though, they, you know, they're the guns and they're the ones who use force and coercion. And you know, often we will say, you know, I, I mean, I'm an anarchist, so I would like to say the state doesn't exist. But you know, they do come knocking on your door. I've spent some time in jail. You know, they they will, you know, they will come after you. Are they a legitimate um, entity? I mean. In my opinion, no, but they're around, and you know, I think it would be naive to just simply say, "Oh, well, you know, I'm going to exist in this world where they don't." You do get pulled over for speeding. You do get stopped for your uh, registration papers. You have to have your license, otherwise, they send a sheriff to your door. You know, so the reality. Is there. I yeah. mean, it's a good point. So, you know, when you disobeyed the unjust law. How, how did you feel? Were you scared? Um, I, with regard to the fortifications generally, um, I, I was scared in one instance. Usually I'm not. Usually the cops will uh, leave us alone. There was an incident last year during Liberty Forum in Nashua where things did get a little hairy. You know, it started as a protest and maybe some of your viewers have heard the story, but, you know, it was a large celebration. We probably had over a hundred people there. Um, people were smoking out. There were, you know, four foot bongs. People were driving by and being extremely supportive, honking and supportive of our signs. 
you know, we some motorcycle guy grabbed a joint and smoked a little bit. You know, it was a really fun, happy atmosphere. Um, there were a couple of local kids, one of which who was black, and uh, two narcs came in, arrested the only black kid um, amongst a hundred white people, and things got a little hairy. I mean, it ended up with in squad cars there. Some of our fellow activists, people like Catherine Blue, got arrested. Um, they had police dogs. And that was the one time where I was like, uh, you know, this, I mean, I prefer my activism to be, um, to not get arrested. <laughs> you know, when, when, I'm when with I you on that one. It's, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not that much fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it does play an important role in the sense that, you know, oftentimes arrests will escalate things or will get more media attention or those kinds of things. So it is sort of a double-edged sword. So uh, a couple undercover cops show up and there's a sea of uh, white people, one black guy. They arrested the one black guy? They they arrested the one black guy. I mean, if it, it you know... It, it's awful, but of course it was a horrible experience for that kid. Um, so they arrested him and Catherine that day and then actually went back afterwards and arrested uh, a few other of the the more um, civil disobedient who just stood in front of the police car and said, you know, we're not going to move, which I think is a very powerful um, way to, to, you know, show our, our disgust or our dismay with, with these unjust laws. So they were, um, you know, quietly resisting, peacefully resisting. Um, David Krauss from Key got down in front of the car. He got dragged away by, by the policeman. Um, you know, handcuffed, he was threatened, um, they threatened to mace him, um, so it was a pretty hairy situation. The, the good parts that I think came out of that is, you know, we got some media attention. Also, I think it was for the community to just show, you know, we did a collection and collected the bail for the, for the kid at the courthouse, or at the jail rather, and he and his parents and his friends came back and did another, pro, uh, another rally, another celebration, and they came back and he had a sign that said, Nashua PD, I'm back. And I thought that was, <laughs> I think it's important to show that, you know, the intimidation doesn't work. It's sort of, it's similar to, I think, Naomi Wolf who had said, you know, if you do some kind of protest, stop traffic. You know, if you're abiding by, um, you know, free speech zones and you're going where you can be marked and all of those things, it's not as effective as, you know, just sort of going balls to the walls. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. I, I, I've seen some video of the uh, folks who stood in front of the cars and that that took a lot of courage, and I really admired that. You know what, um, you know what they did, folks like David Krause. So, um, you know, as you were kind of working up to the decision of whether to disobey an unjust law or not, um, did you struggle with that, or, or did it come pretty easily? Um, you know, it it came fairly easily. Although I have to say, you know, it is tough. Um, you know, putting yourself out there in these ways, um, it and and this is sort of anecdotal, but um, I found it more interesting. I you know I'm I'm turning 39, and if you and I finally smoked pot in front of my parents, and <laughs> and I thought that was a really interesting experience because you know I had to explain to them um, that just because this thing is illegal doesn't make it a bad thing and you know they, they like to drink there uh, and you know it's like well what if the government had said um, your glass of wine mom is illegal so now suddenly you can't have it would you continue to drink wine and just break that law and having that conversation with them really sort of how I some of the things that you know I just do in my my activist life so um, I think you know there's a dual thing in the sense that it's both us relating to the state and sort of um, that relationship, but then there's also a community relationship and your parents and your friends. And if we can change those people's minds, that is, is going to take us where we want to go a lot faster. Nicely said. So how, how did your parents react at first? Were they critical? They, no, I mean, I think they knew, you know, 
that I smoke pot, but I just had never done it in front of them. And I had that sense where, why am I embarrassed or why am I hiding this part of my life from them? There's no reason to do it. I'm not doing something that's wrong, unethical, immoral, or any of those things. And um, actually, my dad smoked with me. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Um, so that was sort of interesting. I, I do feel that, you know, the more we can change just the minds of the people around us, um, we, we, you know, we can smash the state without having to smash it because it'll just be a, the community just saying these things are not acceptable. And we see that in you know, places like San Francisco where it's decrimmed, um, you know, where just the police eventually decide it's worth our while. Mm -hmm. Nice. Very nicely said. So. Are you um, scared to discuss these kinds of things in public? Or are you worried about any kind of backlash? Um, yes. Um, I mean, I, I tend to think that, you know, if you speak the truth, um, I, I don't believe I'm doing something wrong. So, you know, I mean, I certainly hope this doesn't tee up some kind of, you know, raid on the sixth hole. I don't know. <laughs> I want the officers to come land here if they need to. But, um, but you know, I, I spoke to um, Matt Simon from the uh, coalition here in New Hampshire that works on sort of decriminalization. And he said an interesting thing to me once. He was, they generally don't come after people who are outspoken and who know their rights. I was an attorney for 10 years. Um, you know, so, so I, you know, this is not throwing down the gauntlet or anything, but, you know, I hope that more positive would come in good. And I think the more people who speak out, the faster we will affect change. So yes, you know, I'm fearful. I don't, I don't want to go to jail, but, um, you know, I, I don't think things are going to change unless we get more people to speak out. You know, even Ian Freeman on Free Talk Live was saying, and this was years ago when I was still in New York, I remember listening to a show and he said, but where are the doctors and the lawyers and the, you know, the upstanding citizens, be that as it may, coming out and saying, I smoke pot and I think this is ridiculous, you know, and I'm like, I'm people, so, uh, you know, that was my call to to do something, and, and here I am. <laughs> here we have an upstanding citizen. Well. So, <laughs> so do you, do you, uh, are you opposed to all laws or just the unjust ones? And how do you differentiate between the just and the unjust? Um, that is a great question. Am I opposed to all laws? I am opposed to, whoa, sorry. I went dead there. I am opposed to, um, I think all laws brought in solution. I believe that all exchanges should be voluntary. I believe that um, the market will decide and that, you know, um, you and I can, can decide what kind of terms we want to have on anything. So, how oh, that's such a tricky question. I mean, I think Starting with the, I think starting with the unjust laws is a good place to start. Um, you know, I think um, for a lot of people, anarchy is a hard um, philosophical thing mind around, and and it, you know, to start with that, I see. I think uh, panics a lot of people. They they think chaos. They think oh, it's going to be, you know, this insane Mad Max world, and I don't believe it will be, but. Probably in terms of baby steps, obviously unjust laws, I think that's something that uh, creates empathy and sympathy. We saw that with sort of the TSA goings on where people, ordinary people who, are, who wouldn't self-identify as activists were riled up and they were like, actually I don't want these petting my kids or, you know, so um, so I think starting with the unjust laws is, is a good place to start um, and, you know, everyone own level of risk assumption and sort of need to figure out for themselves what that is. Amen. Amen. Very nicely said, Carla. Uh, before we go, do you have any projects or websites or anything you'd like to plug? Oh, no. People always ask me this. Obviously, you know, if you haven't heard of the Free State, check out the Free State Project. I am working on it, uh, but I'm not going to announce it here, maybe in the next few months. Okay. And that's freestateproject.org. Yep. All right, well, I thank you very much, Carla, for being with us today. I really appreciate it. I think we had a great conversation here. And um, I wish you a, uh, a very happy and pleasant day.
Thank you. You too, George. Okay. Bye, Carla. Take care. You too.